Вопрос. Александр Потапов, исполнительный директор. Я не буду говорить какие-то, что называется, гробить пересказом прекрасную презентацию нашего сегодняшнего гостя Марка Бюнгера, который, который является нашей сегодня специально приглашенной звездой, что называется, является при этом директором по исследованию Люкс Research, с которым мы долго и хорошо сотрудничаем в рамках РВК. Наша, наш семинар сегодня пройдет в традиционном ключе, то есть сначала будет презентация на очень интересную тему, мне кажется, это будущее инновационных систем, но и не только, как вы видите из названия. Затем вопросы и ответы, презентация будет на английском, вопросы, естественно, вы можете задавать на русском, у нас есть переводчик, который сможет их перевести, ну я в общем надеюсь на то, что завяжется какая-то дискуссия. Все мероприятие у нас рассчитано до часа дня. И я надеюсь, что мы будем, у нас сегодня такой полудомашний формат, и мы, я думаю, уложимся прекрасно. Прошу активно участвовать, и главное, прошу представляться, как только вы решите задать вопрос, потому что, как видите, мы сегодня без бэджи. То есть многие, конечно, друг другу знакомы, но тем не менее. Вот. Все, спасибо. На этом я передаю слово Марку. Марк, the audience is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Добрый утро, очень приятно. Меня зовут Марк Бенгер, работаю в Lux Research. И я не говорю по-русски. Uh, that's the last Russian you will have to hear from me. Um, thank you very much. It is very, very nice to, uh, it's always nice to be in Moscow. This is my third or fourth time. And uh, like a, a lot of you, you know, growing up in the Cold War, our countries were not good friends. And um, the thought of ever coming to Moscow at all was a very big dream. Uh, And um, so when I say that I'm happy to be here, I don't mean it in the little way of it's a nice day and the food is good. I mean, it's very, very happy that we can collaborate in this way. Yes, more? Okay, can you hear, uh, can you hear me better now? Okay. So um, what Lux Research does as a very brief introduction is we analyze companies that are mostly venture backed. So from a good day in the laboratory until IPO, the company's lifetime throughout that process is what we study. Uh, we analyze about 4,000 companies every year. We're talking to their managers, their CEOs, their investors, and their, uh, uh, their customers to get an understanding of how their business is doing. And we use that information to advise investors on whether they should make an investment, Uh, what the strengths and weaknesses of the company are, and so on. This presentation is much more high level. This is looking at the collective view of these thousands of companies and a way that you can think about your own company, the companies that you invest in, the companies that your colleagues are building, and get an understanding of where they'll be going, how they will evolve. So forecasting the future of science-based businesses, of technology, and where business opportunities will come from technology. So uh, can everyone understand my English? It's good, okay, good. Am I speaking too slowly? No, okay, how about this? No, just kidding. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so we should be recording now. So uh, this is, a very detailed text slide. There are a lot of detailed text slides in this presentation. You don't need to read it. You will get the slides, correct? Okay, if you like. Um, and I believe this will be posted for, for people to see in here. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a summary of the presentation today. Again, we're looking at the future of science, technology, and business. And I'm going to talk about where the technology is today, but also how business itself is changing. So the idea that we have technology that's invented at a university, we put venture money into it, or we license out patents and create a new company, and then we take it to a public market, is changing very rapidly because of new ways of funding business, new ways of organizing, and new ways of manufacturing. So when you think of the far future, 
a lot of times you think of something like this. Something great big, it's off in the distance. It's maybe very big and red and exciting, but it's, it's not really close. And you think you have a long time to plan as it comes towards you. So um, sometimes we think about things like space or quantum computing or some very advanced biotechnology. What I want to talk with you today about is a general model for how technologies evolve, how you can use that to predict where you should go with your own business, what investments you should or should not make, and most importantly, how to accelerate innovation across Russia and outside of Russia, so connecting with other parts of the world. The connection is the most important part. So I'll start with, as I said, space is often the symbol of the future. And maybe you recognize this thing. This is a picture, well, it's a, uh, a Sputnik. And um, as you know, the first satellite in space was a huge shock to the world. Everybody was surprised that the space age had arrived when it did. Uh, in the United States, this was the, the, uh, the newspaper. It says, Russians win race to launch Earth satellite. Man on threshold of space travel. So this is a dream that had existed for centuries or thousands of years maybe. And all of a sudden, one day, it was there and it shocked everybody. So I think there's a kind of a funny little note here. Can, can, uh, yeah, I've lost the connection here. Okay. This says, U.S. may speed up satellite program. Maybe we'll speed up the satellite program now that the Russians have a satellite in space. That's a, an understatement. They were completely going crazy because, oh my gosh, we're, you know, we're losing. So uh, the, uh, you know, the U.S. put a, a lot of effort into speeding up the space program and uh, 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 roughly 15, 20 years later had it put a person on the moon. The, um, this competition and how fast everything was happening, the point of this is that it didn't gradually appear from one day to the next, the, the uh, urgency was there. And that's the, the number one lesson that I want you to bring with you from innovation. It, it happened suddenly, so why? Well, the, the, the age of the space race, as I said, it pervaded culture. And this is a television advertisement from about 1969, so about the time uh, the uh, US landed on the moon. And the... Uh, so the company, this says RCA invites 2,000 people with $2,000 to leap into the year 2000. So $2,000 was a lot of money for a television in 1969. It's about $12,000 today. Um, and if you read this advertisement, it's very excited and, and uh, hopeful about the future. So it says things like, in one giant step, like Neil Armstrong said, in one giant step, uh, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, uh, we've unveiled a new century in color television. Next thing. Sitting like, a, sitting like a silent spaceship, its sculptured whiteness curves to a rosewood veneer top. So more space. And the next thing, please. 23-inch diagonal screen. Mo some of you maybe have notebook computers with 23-inch screens. But that was a gargantuan. It was a huge television at the time. Uh, computer design. So they spent a lot of time in this ad talking about how computers, another symbol of the future, were involved. Next thing. We've eliminated the conventional VHF tuner. In its place are new computer-like memory circuits. And if you didn't understand that, they say it again. Com electronic circuits with memories. And uh, the, the 2000 uh, was made possible this help with it. This soon with the help of computers. So this is all, again, very exciting. And then the last thing it says, uh, for once, for $2,000, all you could get was a trip around the world. Now you can travel through time. You can travel to the next century. So they were very excited about this television. And RCA was one of the most innovative corporations throughout the 1900s in the United States. Uh, you can see some of the things that they made. Color television, high definition TV, electron microscope, the liquid crystal display. It's highlighted for a reason. Um, but they, d they made all kinds of amazing inventions. And yet, the next slide, uh, they didn't last to see the year 2000. 
they died in 1986. So how could that happen? Um, well, if we look at today and what an actual $12,000 computer looks like, or, uh, sorry, $12,000 television looks like, it's this. Um, this is from LG, the Korean manufacturer. Uh, it's It's 55 inches diagonal, so about a meter and a half. Uh, it's only four millimeters thick because it uses a different technology, OLEDs, and not the cathode ray tube. So a 55 inch cathode ray tube would be, you know, from here to the wall, it would have weighed probably a ton of glass. You just couldn't make a 55 inch cathode ray tube in any reasonable uh, way. But LEDs make this possible. So uh, as I mentioned, um, GE, or sorry, L RCA invented the LCD. They also were working on LEDs. Um, they, I think, would have never been able to envision this future. Uh, now, by the way, this is the actual LG ad. We're still using space as a metaphor for the future. Um, it's still the thing that ignites our imaginations. Um, but the most impossible thing about this advertisement for somebody in 1969 at RCA would be that a Korean company made it. Korea was about like Pakistan or something in the 60s, 70s, 80s. It was a, a, a terribly impoverished country. And today, I would guess at least half of you have a Korean cell phone in your hand. You have a Korean television at your house. Okay? If you're Nokia, you know about Koreans. Um, so the, the, the way things can change and how quickly, you know, your imagination is actually the worst, your worst enemy. It's your inability to see these things and then figure out how they might happen. Th that's, that's the biggest risk for you. So next slide. So if we look at how did this evolve, so let's take that you know, uh, vision of the future that was totally wrong and the actual future that was way better than the vision. How did it happen? The initial te technology, as I said, was a cathode ray tube, so CRT. Um, and that was what computers look like. Even in movies that are a few years old, you see people with this kind of a screen, you know when it was. Right? Because now we all use this. So C LCD, LEDs. Well, the next generation, the things that you see uh, in prototypes at electronic shows today are printed or flexible uh, displays, even textile displays. So basically a, um, the way you uh, lay down the electronics on a sheet of glass or a piece of plastic to make a device like this, you can do that on a, a piece of plastic that's flexible and bendy. Okay, so this is not just a Photoshop. This is, these are actual devices. Um, so what happens next? Well, we see a trend been going from heavy and rigid to lighter, uh, potentially flexible, to actually flexible. Um, maybe I have this idea. This is just imagination. It doesn't exist. But this is applesauce. Well, here's an Apple computer. Maybe in the future we will have uh, a jar of display. You can pour it out. It's a beads, you know, electronic beads and suspension. They identify, okay, who are my neighbors, which pixel is to my left, right, up, down, and they can create a display out of nothing. Now that's the crazy vision, like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the spaceship t television. I don't know that that will ever happen, but you can see that there's a trend here. We just need to figure out how fast could that happen. What are the component technologies you would need to make it uh, possible? and who is working on those things today. So there are actually scientists working on that today. Are they gonna succeed? Will it be economically feasible? We don't know, but we know where to look. Okay, so um, these flexible displays, uh, like I said, they're actually prototypes, but there are actually some in the market as well. And uh, as I said, RCA would have never seen that a Korean company would beat it to the market. Uh, this is, um, well, sorry, if you could back up. So the smart watch is sort of the logical extension from notebook, or sorry, desktop computer, notebook computer, tablet, and cell phone to now this, you know, they keep getting smaller and smaller. That's the trend. So your phone is a small view of your computer, right? So you have some information on your phone that you have on your computer, but your computer is kind of the, the, the basis of where you keep things. And then you maybe have some cloud storage somewhere. Well. The next logical thing in getting smaller and more portable is to have a watch. So this is a, uh, the idea of a smart watch is that you can get some of the information and functions on your phone, but on your wrist. 
So Apple's been working on this. They have a 100-person team. They've been talking about, oh, we have so many patents in smartwatches. Uh, Samsung, this is a quote actually from Samsung. We've been pre preparing the watch product for so long. We're ver working very hard to get ready for it. We're preparing products for the future, and the watch is definitely one of them. Did anybody see about um, three weeks ago or so? There were, Samsung actually launched their smartwatch. So they finally got to market. Well, about a year ago, this guy, who's a, a young, I think he's maybe 30 year old Canadian inventor, was the first to, to uh, market with a different smartwatch, the one I'm wearing. So um, uh, the, his company is called Pebble, and um, Pebble was having a very hard time raising any money from venture capitalists. They had a, a prototype, um, but the whole hardware idea, you know, how are you going to compete with Apple and Samsung, sounds like a bad investment. So he couldn't get any money. So he um, went to Kickstarter. Have any of you heard of Kickstarter? Okay, about a third, maybe a half. So Kickstarter is a site where if you have a project or an idea, you describe that on this web page, and you say, uh, for given different amounts of money, what you'll give the people that give you that money. So for example, most of them say, for $5, I'll put your name on the web page as a backer. Maybe I'll send you a sticker. For $15, you'll get a t-shirt. Uh, for $50 or $100 or $200, you get the product when it's complete. So I was one of the people who gave them $150, and about 12 months later, when the watch was actually built, uh, they sent it to me. So, and you can see this, by the way, if you like. So when I get a text message, it shows up on this watch. If I get an email then I w that I want to see here, then I put it, that it comes up. So weather and just some things that I don't have to pull out my phone for all the time um, are now here. Now, a lot of uh, the functions that you find in the Samsung and the more advanced devices, these will keep developing. So this is a, the, the sort of the minimum smartwatch you can possibly buy. And they'll just keep getting better and better. These, on the other hand, what other features? You saw the Apple, the new iPhone launch a few weeks ago. They changed the colors. They made the case plastic. They didn't really do anything anybody has been asking for. It's boring is what it is. That. So... This is where we know we're going to see a lot of innovation and development. This is pretty much at the end of the road until those flexible displays come along. So um, now, one of the, the reasons this was so successful was because it was a great idea. So this wasn't just funding, it was also marketing. So when people saw this watch, he was hoping to raise um, $100,000. They raised $10 million from people like me who said, if you make the watch, you know, send it to me. And if you don't, the people that do this are a little crazy, like me, they, and probably like you, you, you like innovation. You want to be part of developing something new. So if you don't get it, you lose the money. There's risk involved with this uh, way of funding. But there's also the reward that um, you're helping to uh, develop things. And in the case of the company, the reward is it's not dilutive. It's not equity. You're selling a product. So you get revenue. It's not, you don't owe anybody else anything. It's a great way to start a company if you're uh, an entrepreneur. Um, and the best thing, though, is that you get marketing. So not only did they sell 85,000 of these where they had expected to sell a few thousand, they also got the whole world to know what their product is. So now if you go into an electronics store in the United States, you can buy the Pebble Watch because everybody knows what it is. It was advertised effectively with, with no cost. There's no, you didn't have to pay for that advertisement. They got great publicity. So I'm going to pause again. English okay? Am I speaking too fast? Okay, good, great. Uh, so, and so, sorry, one other thing about the, the pebble that's, that I think is one of the best things is you see the different faces you can get here? There's a community of developers. You can develop apps for the watch the same way you can develop apps for the smartphone. Now, this is not as much of a change as you might think. Higgs boson, does anybody know what the Higgs boson is? Nobel Prize earlier, yes, about a week ago. All right, so um, the uh, uh, examples I've been giving you uh, so far are a little bit like you know random pieces of observations and data from different experiments. So we're looking at the economy and at technology and starting to get some ideas that m there might be a pattern here. You know, I said, okay, this is how the screens evolved. This is how the smartwatch evolved. And the question is, can we take some of these uh, observations and start to bring them into a grand unified theory of innovation, the way we have a grand unified theory in physics. So the Higgs boson, as you might know, 
is, is this missing particle that was just uh, discovered that uh, was the discovery was given the Nobel Prize. Um, and the question is, uh, since it can tell us something about the evolution of the universe and you know, the big picture, can we do something like that? Sorry, next slide. That the Grand Unified Theory did, taking electricity, magnetism, and light, electromagnetism, combining that with a weak nuclear force, all these different forces in innovation. Can we do what we've done here in physics for innovation? So the next slide. So this Grand Unified Theory, let's just go straight to that. What, what pieces would that start with? Well, the, the really fundamental forces uh, and, and, and people in innovation. This is Joseph Schumpeter, who you might know from the term creative destruction. So he would be sort of the Isaac Newton, if you will, of innovation. And so I was looking at some of his early writings. And I'm not going to have you read all this. I just want to point out some of the, he's an economist, some of the things he was saying um, in his work, The Theory of Economic Development in 1934. So he says, economies stay in circular flow, which without any innovations or innovative activities leads to a stationary state. The stationary state is described by Walrasian equilibrium, which we all know what that is, right? No, nobody knows what that is, of course. Now, economies follow, as he said, four main wave cycles. So he was seeing basically sort of overlapping and you know, amplification and taking waves like light and trying to make the economy fit that model. So there was the 54-year Kondratiev wave, the 18-year Kuznets wave, the 9-year Jugular wave, and the 4-year Kitchen wave. Again, has anybody ever heard of these things? No, because these are terrible ideas. They don't make any sense at all. Just so if this was the last thing he ever wrote, we would have never heard of this crazy economist. Um, next, please. So this, this doesn't even make any sense. Um, what we remember him for is this. 1942, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, where he wrote, the process of industrial mutation, if I may use that biological term, so he's gone from physics to the biological metaphor, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. This is why we know this guy. This is why, this is why he's Isaac Newton and not some you know, other crazy alchemist from the Middle Ages. So. His lasting contribution was not his model, which was terrible, but the fact that he identified the exception. So here he also identified it, excluding any innovations and innovative activities. That exclusion, that thing that he tried to sort of, well, that's just noise in the data, that is the whole point. So we know he's, uh, like I said, he's sort of a founding father of this science of innovation. If we can go to the next. So not long after that, people uh, sociologists actually started looking at how innovations uh, uh, diffused through a society. And from that initial spark, that, that uh, uh, innovation, that disruption that Schumpeter was talking about, they saw that distribution, the, the diffusion followed an S-curve. So this is very, very early research, but based on social science where they saw things like, you know, how ladies in Paris adopted a new fashion. Uh, how uh, Indians in the United States, the, the Native Americans, adopted s uh, new technologies like guns or, or horses. And what they found was that there's an initial slow period, a rapid a adoption, and then a, a tapering. So this was very early research. We think of the S-curve. Everybody who's heard of the S-curve or seen this? Or a few more people? So this idea that adoption follows an S-curve is very, very fundamental to how we think about new products today. Uh, it's, it's our basic model that um, you have uh, this initial um, uh, imitation, basically. People don't all evaluate a product um, uh, that they see in a store for the first time. The, there are a few people that do that. They discover the product. But everybody else after that is imitating somebody else they know that has the product. This is why it diffuses as an S-curve, because it's a social phenomenon. It's not a logical, rational phenomenon. So again, the, the same way that Schumpeter had to break with his idea that this is waves according to some physical thing, this is a social phenomenon. It's not, uh, people don't evaluate products based on their merits. They, ba they evaluate them based on their friends. So again, this probably makes a lot of intuitive sense, but having some data for it 
it wasn't until the, um, the 1930s and 1940s that we actually started to have a lot of data points around this. So Ryan and Gross um, were uh, American scientists looking at how uh, a new type of corn was adopted in, by American farmers. And this is what they measured here. So this is 1926 to 1946, the percentage of farmers who were initially aware of the, the new corn and then who adopted it. So you see some people were, as soon as it was launched, some of them adopted it. The awareness took off right away, and pretty soon that peaked. But there were some people that, even though they were aware of it, it took them a long time, it took them you know, five or 10 years to adopt that product. Why was that? Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So one of the most important uh, uh, people who studied innovation in the 1900s was this guy right here. Um, so he it was actually his father was one of those farmers, he was one of the late adopters, and his farm didn't do very well. So his family turned, got very poor because all the farms around them were prospering, his didn't, and he wanted to understand why his father made that decision. So he went to work for the two previous scientists. So um, this guy Rogers, Everett Rogers, uh, he wrote Diffusions of Innovation in 1963. And what he did was he essentially just took, if you, if you see these curves, they line up very nicely. So all that this is, is the rate of, of adoption up there. Low, high, low, low. You can see how these mathematically, if you use calculus, you can see that these two curves are really the same curve. So what he did though, his, his addition to the overall concept here is that the, um, uh, the innovators, early adopters, early majority, these segments of the population are psychological. So it's, are you uh, comfortable with technological risk? Do you want to have something that's new and unproven? Do you want to be the first person to have a watch? Will you pay $150 to some kid you've never met before and hope he'll send you a watch later? You know, or will you go, no, I'm going to wait for the Samsung, you know, smartwatch 17 when they've gotten all the bugs worked out and it has battery life and all the other things I want. So who are you as a person? Well, he said in the population that this is the distribution of those people. So you've got innovators and early adopters. They want to have the first things first. You've got laggards and early, you know, ma late majority. Uh, they they want to wait till everybody else has finished it. So that was great. His, uh, his flaw here is that he tried to assign specific percentages to those numbers. 2.5%, 13.5%. Do you think that that's really that accurate? He has like three significant figures in accuracy here. It's a bit of a stretch. But the idea was right. So the other really lasting contribution that he made, and this was just like Schumpeter's you know, observation that these exceptions, those innovations were what disrupted the cycle. His observation about the exceptions, that the most important contribution is this. He said that innovators are people who reinvent. They take an innovation and they change or modify it. Okay? So we talk about the maker movement, we talk about tinkerers, we talk about people who experiment with the technologies they get, who want to hack their products. That's who he's talking about. So this was his real lasting contribution. This is his creative destruction. Next slide. Okay, so we, um, uh, we take this, these, all these models continue to get modified. So who's heard of crossing the chasm or the valley of death? A few of you, okay. So this happens to small companies. They have a product, it's really successful, it's just they see the numbers going up and up and up, starting from zero. They see these, you know, adoption, strong adoption by innovators and technology enthusiasts and the early adopters and visionaries, but then they fall into this thing called the chasm. So this guy, um, uh, his name is, uh, I always mix him up with Gordon, Jeffrey Moore, Jeffrey Moore and Gordon Moore, I always mix up. Jeffrey Moore uh, said, innovators want to try to see if it works. Early adopters are not looking for an improvement, they're looking for a breakthrough. And then the early majority wants reliable improvement. So psychologically, these people are very different. And what the chasm is about is that these people, they really want technology for its own sake. If they can't convince or make a case to these people, or if the technology actually doesn't have practical value, then it doesn't cross this chasm and the company dies. It falls into the, the chasm is like a, a, a big pit, a big hole. So we keep modifying this model. Go to the next one, please. We're getting towards our grand unified theory. Um, and this is something that like when we analyze the um, electric vehicle market, 
So electric vehicles sounded like a really great idea in 2005 when oil prices were going up and up and up. Com car companies were investing in the technology like batteries and motors to make them possible. But the adoption has not been as high as they would have hoped. And we actually used this model to forecast a much lower adoption of electric vehicles than the car makers were hoping for. And this is why. So again, I don't hope you don't need to read all this. Just the title, Electric Vehicles Hippie Phase. So hippies are the, uh, the people like, um, you know, they love the earth and they have long hair and they play acoustic guitar and eat organic food. And uh, they wear clothing they made themselves from uh, organic cotton. You know, they're just, they're not, they're nice people, but they're not mainstream car buyers. And they're the people that have been driving these electric vehicles. They're like, oh, we have to all save the planet, so let's go, you know, buy a car that doesn't really make sense to buy from an economic point of view. Cars are still in their hippie phase, the electric vehicles. It still just appeals to these strongly environmental consumers. And you can make an argument that, well, everybody should believe that this is important, but the fact is they don't. So you can spend, you know, you should absolutely support those types of uh, environmental initiatives, but you should also be realistic. If you're owning a business or you're investing in a technology, how long it will take. Don't be blinded by that idealism. Just see them as separate, okay? So make a rational decision, and the chasm helps you do that. Okay, next slide, please. So there's a, a similar thing here, and that is called the hype cycle. Who's heard of the hype cycle from Gartner? A few more of you. Okay, so the hype cycle, oh, by the way, you should hopefully notice that we're just building on the same model here. These are all just iterations of the same basic structure. So the hype cycle um, basically is like, you know, the, it's, it's the, rate of the rate of awareness uh, and the increase in awareness. If you remember, that was in, uh, precedes the adoption. So the hype cycle is basically this. It's people's perception of a technology. Um, initially, you have a technology trigger where R&D, for example, invents something. You have startup companies, their first round of venture capital funding. And then you get this peak of inflated expectation. We, our sort of shorthand for the peak of inflated expectations is when you see it on the cover of The Economist magazine, you know that this is the peak of the hype cycle. Right after that happens, it's going, expectations will go down. People will say, oh, this technology is never going to work. Uh, this is a terrible idea. Think of when you saw electric vehicles on the cover of The Economist. That was probably the peak of, ex of high expectations. And then people get very disappointed in it. They're like, it's not going to work. This is going to be too expensive. Um, and then you get into you know, some second and third rounds of venture capital funding, people that can't extract themselves from the investment that they made. They want to you know, still believe that it's going to work out. Um, you get into second generation products. And then ultimately, uh, when you get to this 20 or 30% early majority, then it starts to, to flatten out the hype. In other words, this is just about perception. Uh, the overly high expectations and the, the too low expectations come into sort of a, a balance. We don't. We don't get too excited about this product anymore because we know what you know. We know what to expect. This is a very stable product. This is one that's still changing every day. People are still trying to say, "Oh, you have one. I see it." You know, you know that that phase, right? And so this happens with every technology. Let's go to the next slide. So bringing all these things together, we've got creative destruction, the technology diffusion, innovators' dilemma. Who has anybody read this book or heard about it? Okay, a few of you. So. There's a book called The Innovator's Dilemma that takes a very different view about innovation. So if you remember, th this has all been smooth. Now we're talking about a disruption. And let me explain the, how that works. Okay. So um, this is Clayton Christensen. His book is The Innovator's Dilemma. And he talks about sustaining and disruptive innovations. So if you think about this, this uh, chart, you've got product performance on a certain angle. It might be something like... Uh, the screen resolution or the battery life or whatever, it increases over time, generally, the green line. And so um, as time goes on, as sustaining innovation gets incrementally better batteries, slightly better screen, uh, maybe faster processor. So those just pr proceed along a, a straight line. Um, then, and this is all backed up by data, so it's, it's a, uh, not a theoretical model. At some point, a disruptive technological innovation comes along and it changes that market. So it makes the old technology obsolete. If this is a, sorry, if this is a CRT, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier and heavier, and it's, it's really pushing past the point where it's 
the practical product. At that point, something like an LCD or LED screen down here, which has been just sort of a gimmick, a toy, not really suitable for the, the main market, starts to take off. Okay, so as one goes away, the next one starts. How does that happen? That is what this book was about. And to tie this in with the previous uh, um, model, this model right here. So if you take this and you put it on its side, and bring it over here, shrink it. This is basically what you have. Early adopters, this, this blue band is the market. So you're before the market, you're too early to be in the market. Uh, you have your innovators and early adopters looking at a product, okay? And then it breaks through, and then at some point only laggards are buying that product, and then these guys are onto the next one. So these actually do integrate well. You know, in our grand unified theory of innovation, these two very different models actually fit together. So the, those green lines, um, again, we have data for this, and this data is what's called experience curves. Now you don't see a lot of this in really early stage innovation. The, the, you only see the very tip. Uh, an experience curve is how it gets cheaper over time to manufacture a product. So this was initially looking at things in the 1930s that were looking at aircraft. Uh, for every, um, every time they doubled the number of aircraft they built, the cost of labor dropped 15%. They figured out better ways to make the product, uh, faster work-throughs and things like that. So over time, the cost of the product drops rapidly, and these green lines are exactly the same as the green lines I showed you. They describe the incremental progress in making a product better, cheaper, faster, more. Now, um, uh, this, was, this study was advanced through by the 1960s, uh, Henderson at BCG made these industry car curves, uh, looked at everything from cars to golf balls, paper bags, and in the slope of that curve, you can now say it's characteristic for an industry. So we can use these to see how fast is a given innovation likely to advance in an industry. And the most famous one, since we have somebody here from Intel, we can talk about Moore's Law. So Moore's Law was the classic example here. The count of transistors on integrated circuits doubles every two years. So you can use these lines to forecast not only where a technology is today, but where it's going to be a few years in the future. And if you're really lucky, in a case like Moore's Law, 10 or 20 or 30 years in the future. So the innovator's dilemma looked basically at this. You've got these green lines that are sustaining. They're the same lines. Just flip the axes. What about this disruption? How does that happen? Because again, that's if you're in venture investment, this is what you want to know. When am I too early to make this happen? When is it too late? Am I, am I jumping on a train that already left the station, land on the, on the rails? So let's go to that next slide. So that's how those integrate together. Now, how about open innovation? I'm sure you've all heard of, yes? Anybody not heard of open innovation? OK, so open innovation is kind of the latest trend. Uh, the, um, the author, if we can go to the next slide. The author of this book, sorry. Uh, We'll get to the book in a second. So this is what we're looking at, the disruptive technological innovation. Now, go to the, uh, sorry, I have one thing. Why is this disruptive? It's because it's not your company doing the, 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 the new innovation. Somehow this technology crosses the boundary of your company. So if you are at company A, you have a good idea, they're saying, no, we're going to keep making our cathode ray tubes. We don't like your little LCDs. Say, I'm going to start my own company. This is stupid. So the people you're investing in are often the people that made this jump. They left their company, they started a new one. They left their university, they started a company. It's a new innovation. So go to the next slide. So open innovation is this idea that there's a funnel of ideas, lots of ideas out here from research and, and internal projects. Uh, they get funneled down over time and go into the market. The open part is that this funnel has dotted lines. So technologies come in, technologies go out, and this is, I'm just highlighting his term, the boundary of the firm. So when you see something like this crossing the line, that's, think of this previous slide, technology is crossing the boundary of the firm. So when a technology is crossing the boundary of the organization, it's disruptive. The technology itself is just technology, but the fact that it's a new organization that's going to compete with the old one, that's the real key breakthrough there. Okay. So you can see how all these models fit together. Some of it's strong, some of it's loose, but all these things do fit together in a, a grand unified theory of innovation. 
And so if we go to the next slide, how do we start using that to make predictions about the future? So again, we analyze thousands of companies and try and track these types of factors. So what I'll show you now is how you can lay the data up in a line and see really how a company is evolving. So when you're little and you go to the doctor, first things that they measure are things like your height and weight, your physical properties, right? To see if you're healthy. As you get older, they start measuring things like your grades. And then after that, you start looking at things like income. These are all sort of the measures of status of a human being. And by the same token, the same way, how we measure the success of a company changes over time. So early, at the, at the low end of this, this line, we're looking at uh, things like, well, let's go and find out. Let's look at that data. Obviously, an early stage company has no sales. They might not even have any employees. So the things that we look at here are patents. We look at a space, like I said, in amorphous you know, liquid displays, the applesauce. Uh, we look at patents. Who's patenting? Who's doing it? Is that rising or falling? And this is actually from screens. So uh, we're looking here at patent families uh, over time, the actual um, projected number of patents in a given space. So here we're looking at um, patent trend analysis we did with a firm called Zacco that does IP analysis. Uh, we're looking at uh, 1993 to 2012, 916 patents were filed, but they peaked in 2006. So that tells us something like, hmm, this is getting a little bit more mature. If the number of patents continues to rise, the technology is still immature, it's still evolving. Okay, when that peaks, then we know that we can start to project how that's going to taper off. So go to the next slide, please. So the next one is this hype cycle. So we start to see the patents coming. Okay, venture investors are starting to become aware. We see some news stories, and that's where the Economist magazine articles come in. So this is, if you can advance the slide, please. Uh, this is, again, looking at flexible displays. In 2001, so pretty early on in this patent uh, activity, we saw in the New York Times, thin flexible batteries may soon be plastered on cardboard or plastic surfaces like cereal boxes. Okay, so we're seeing a cereal box with a display in it. Oh, that's kind of, wow, that sounds really cool and futuristic. Next thing, 2004. The BBC, flexible displays are on the horizon. The future will be a flexible as screens you can roll up and pop into a jacket pocket, enter mass production, BBC. Printed Electronics World in 2005. Organic electronics will be a $30 billion business in 2015 and a $250 billion business in 2025. So that's a pretty bold statement for something we haven't sold one unit of. Um, then the, the peak starts to come down, so 2008, uh, it was about when BASF said that we see a huge market for this. Uh, 2010, uh, Xerox Park, uh, the Palo Alto Research Center of Xerox said, uh, print electronics is just coming down from its hype cycle. And in 2012, Bridgestone was one of the companies that was looking at electronic paper production, bring, brings that to a stop, because they just couldn't find a way to make money on it. By the way, I, I forgot to tell you something. This display is an e-paper display. That's, that's what I wanted to say about this watch. So. Um, now, after that, we can start to look at investment and partnerships. So we've gone through patents, the news cycle, and now we're looking at investment and other types of partnerships in these companies. So this is, again, actual data from looking at uh, printed, flexible, and organic displays from 1996 to 2012, $2.8 billion went into it. And by the way, if you want any of the, the background for this data, I'm happy to share it with you. Um, but uh, so it peaked in 2007 at $388 million into the space. If you remember, I said that was about when the hype cycle peaked. So venture investors, by the way, as smart as everybody is, are, have very much a group mindset. You follow what your friends are doing, your, your other investors. So Samsung, BASF built very strong portfolios in this space at the time. So you can look at who, who uh, they invested in, the different companies. So Samsung, this is their category of companies at the top, BASF, their portfolio companies at the bottom. Okay, and we can see again here, there's a, it's, it's not as clean because investments are, there are fewer investments to track, but it's kind of jagged. We can also see that it's dropping and we project that it's gonna you know, peter out in the next few years. So not a great, it's a little late to get into printed flexible and organic displays. Okay, next slide. So the experience curves. So this is also something we track. We'll talk with the people in the factory we talk with the suppliers, we say, what are the different costs of your components? So in this case, the gray is driver electronics, the dark blue is operating expenses, the light blue is capital expenses, uh, the uh, light yellow is, is uh, 
the um, uh, uh, GFE, sorry, it's not my not my technology. Um, but uh, we can track and see how that's falling over time, and again project that forward. That you know by 2020 we expect the cost to be pretty stable. That experience curve will be pretty flat. Okay, so we know where that's going to go, and based on that we can say, okay, if a display costs not $50, but $5 or 50 cents, what's the adoption of that likely to be? So we look at different segments and how they're adopting it, so early adopters, early majority, and so on, and now we get into this curve and we start to make a forecast about who's going to buy what. Uh, and if you could just do one more. There you go. So we look at the different applications that those go into, how much they use today, how many units they sell, what those units cost, and so on, and that's how we make a forecast. So I understand this is very complicated, but I hope that conceptually it's actually pretty easy. You just look at these things in this order, and if you track them well enough, you can make a pretty good reasonable estimate about where a technology is going to go. Okay. Now that's all continuing innovation. Like I said, that's the, uh, this green line. Uh, we'll get to the red line in a minute. But the green line, um, as I was saying earlier, there's a minimum market viability and a maximum mar market viability, and as an investor or inventor, you need to know when those are. So thinking again about this increase in performance over time, w you know, what makes a technology ready for the market for a given application? And what makes it obsolete? That's what we're trying to say. How can you make your first product actually take in the market, and when should you stop investing in improvement? These two lines. And as an example, uh, again, using displays. Um, this is, uh, this was Mattel electronic football. So this was um, the toy that my brother and I fought over like crazy in about 1977. Um, it's, uh, you're, you're pressing buttons to uh, um, play American football, and uh, it's, it's 15 LEDs. So it's three times five, red or black, that's it. And this was as immersive an experience as Xbox is today for kids. You were absolutely on the field playing football. It's, we could do this for hours. My kids can't see it. All they see is blinking lights. They, they, they cannot envision a football game going on with this rudimentary, you know, primitive device. Um, so if you look at sort of that as the minimum uh, screen resolution for representing a football game is three by five pixels. I don't think you could do it with two by five pixels, for example. Um, that's the, the very bare minimum here. And over time, LED displays got richer and richer, more colors, more density. So we went from three pixels per inch to the screen we have today, which is called retina display, 300 pixels per inch. Now, do you know why it's called retina display? Anybody? Why is it called retina display? Right, so your retina can't see anywhere. So unless you're designing a screen for um, a spider or a hawk or some animal that has better eyes than we do, you don't need to make any better display ever. There's no reason to ever do that, at least for this, this particular application. So basically in the course of 33 years, we went from the minimum viable to the maximum useful uh, uh, innovation in that space. This is not just for displays. If we go to the next slide. This happens in all technologies. So here's again our Mattel electronic football at the base, Apple iPhone at the max. Let's look at pregnancy tests. Okay. So before, well, for all of human evolution until 1927, if you wanted to know if you were pregnant, you had to guess. Or you know, people would like wave a stick at you and tell you if you're, it, nobody knew basically. But in 1927, a chemical test was invented. It was called the Ashheim and Zondek, the rabbit test. And what they would do is take the urine of a woman you wanted to know if she was pregnant and inject it into a rabbit or a frog or some other animals. And if the woman was pregnant, the ovaries of that test animal would swell up and the animal would die. Or at least you could tell, uh, you could open up the animal and see if the ovaries were swollen and if the animal died, you knew for sure that they had swollen so much that it, it killed it. So this is why it's called the rabbit test. And um, uh, so in the United States, uh, maybe in the UK too, if you say the rabbit died, that's a way to say a woman is pregnant. So if you, there's an Aerosmith song, if you, any of you like Aerosmith, the rabbit done died, that means that my girlfriend got pregnant. Um, so that was the first chemical test. You can see this is kind of an inconvenient test. Okay, you're going to collect some urine, 
put it in a box, send it to a lab. They're going some, you know, researcher is going to inject an animal with it. A few days later, is going to open up that animal and check the ovaries. By the time they've done all this, you probably already had the baby. Right? It takes a long time. It's very expensive. It's very inconvenient. So over time, that chemical test got shrunk, put into you know smaller and smaller formats. And by 1976, we had the early pregnancy test. So this is a plastic stick with a piece of paper in it with just the chemicals that you need to see that same ingredient in urine if it's present. And so now it's about as easy as it could possibly be. You just go to the bathroom, and you can check and see if you're pregnant, and you get the answer right away. And it costs about $5. So <laughs> you don't need to check really any more than that, right? And it's $5. It's not couldn't really get much cheaper to make any sense. So this is kind of its maximum point of viability. Okay, totally different technology. Passenger aircraft. So the number of passengers you can put on a plane. The first passenger aircraft is, of course, Ski S-22 here in Russia in 1914. Uh, it took about 11 passengers. Um, the flights were maybe 45 minutes long, and they had lobster and uh, uh, you know a samovar and everything on this, this plane. So it was a very nice ride. Um, but uh, by the 1970s, we had the Boeing 747, which takes about 300 passengers. And um, until very recently, with the A380, this was the biggest plane in the world um, in terms of passenger carrying capacity. So uh, that's kind of the end of the line. If you think, could we put 1,000 people on, on one plane? Technically, yes, we could do that. But economically, you know, we can't. There's no more use to having bigger and bigger planes. We're going for smaller, faster, shorter flights. So if you're looking at, um, for example, there are a lot of uh, Russian companies making smaller jets. So you've got. Um, uh, it's not illusion, but anyway, you have a few uh, Russian companies that are looking at making uh, commercial, small commercial planes for the international market. So maybe that's a, you know, a good technology to get into. Back to the red line. So when these things end, w as I said earlier, a disruption happens. So how does that disruption happen? Well, one of the key ways is that the, the product that's obsolete becomes a part of the next generation product. So some examples of how this is happening. So phones and iPads are now becoming the brains in robots. So this is Romo, a little personal robot that you can get. Uh, this is uh, double robotics. They have like a Segway, a two-wheeled robot with an iPad for a face. Um, so those things become parts of the next generation of technology. Uh, similarly with pregnancy tests. So the way you don't need to check pregnancy tests, say, five times a day or anything else. What they do instead is they check several things. When you go in for your pregnancy test, they'll also check for other diseases. Um, they'll check for you know, other things that you can measure. And they put them, that's called a multiplex test. So they put many tests on one device instead. And Sony has done a good job of integrating uh, CD technology with these tests. How many of you have a CD player still? A few of you, OK. So you know your laggards, right? Um, so Sony has all this CD manufacturing equipment that they don't know what to do with because nobody buys CDs anymore. So they did something very smart. They figured out they can make uh, microfluidics tests. So you have a plastic disc. It has little grooves and holes in it. You put in samples and reagents. You put it in a centrifuge. That's the spinner. Okay, so it, it causes the reactions to happen and separates out the components. And then it's got a laser and a reader so you can analyze what's in that sample. So it's not a, probably not as big a market as making CDs for music, but it's bigger than nothing, which is what they would have otherwise. Um, same thing with the Boeing passenger aircraft. That pa it's been around for 40 years now. There are a lot of old planes that you can't fly anymore for a lot of reasons in the 747 class. Well, there's a company called Strata Launcher that um, Paul Allen from Microsoft started. And his idea, you can see this is a 747 and some engines, two 747s together. We could put those together and use that as a first stage for heavy lift uh, rocket launches. So Strata Launcher is a company based in Southern California. They're working on building this and actually taking, uh, uh, you know, making space uh, launches more inexpensive. So I was down in the area where Strata Launcher uh, is, is building. Um, it's called uh, Mo the Mojave Air and Spaceport. It's just north of Los Angeles. And there are dozens of space startups there. So it's like the Silicon Valley of space. Um, this is me sitting in, this is their, you know, their picture of what they're building. This is a company called Xcore Aerospace. And so, um, uh, yeah, when it's done, it should look like that and make, you know, short little flights into suborbital space. 
Now, I don't, to be honest, I don't think they're a great investment. I think that they're probably not a good investment, but they're doing some interesting things that would make them not viable at all if they weren't doing them. So next slide, please. So this is them test firing their engine. Um, what's interesting about their engine is it uses the principle I just told you about, taking an obsolete or, or mature technology from a different place and bringing it in. In this case, it's a piston pump from an automobile. So this is what basically moves the fuel from the tank to the engine in their, uh, their ship. Now, this is what they say. Our pumps are fabricated using readily available automotive manufacturing techniques developed over the past 120 years. This allows us to competitively procure by high quality components while avoiding the overhead of maintaining a specialized manufacturing base. The latest generation is 20 times more powerful at twice the weight. After more than 10 years of working, I think we're getting good at this. So they're doing basically what hackers do. You know, when somebody builds this watch or this thing and they scavenge parts from old broken stuff and then work on it, that's what they're doing to make rockets. Go to the next slide. And it's not just, you know, scrappy startups. This is on the International Space Station. These are some robots that float around and help the astronauts with different things. They use these little fans to move around. Uh, if you turn one of them around, they use smartphones for brains. So NASA said, why would we develop a screen, a battery, a communications device, a protocol, uh, you know, camera, microphone, speakers? Why would we develop all this with, you know, for millions of dollars when for $300 we can have you know, one that works perfectly well, is small, it's, you know, we know how it works, there's all these developers that can break into it. So it's, it, this is a much smarter way for even large organizations like NASA to do their innovation. Okay, next. So the idea here, the principle here, these red lines, the disruptions, are when you take a lot of mature technologies at the top of their development and you bring them into one new one at the bottom. So think about a smartphone. Apple really didn't invent anything. That's how they were able to get into the cell phone business, going from nothing to the, the phone that changed the cell phone industry in one year with their first product, the iPhone, in 2007. They took things like retina display, memory storage, the weight, the talk time. All these things were mature technologies in other spaces. And you know, the retina display, as I said, you don't need a better display. 64 gigabytes, most of us can get by with 64 gigabytes. We have not that many songs. It couldn't get much lighter. It's got battery life. It's got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all these mature things. They didn't need to really invent much. They just needed to integrate what already existed. So this is actually how disruption happens. It's not like, yeah, I worked in the lab for 50 years until I finally got it right. It never, ever works that way. It always works like this. So, next slide. so this is a completely different industry. These green lines are the same uh, green lines as before. They're in, in, uh, uh, incremental innovation. The disruption is bringing them together. And in this case, the, the disruptive new technology is a uh, synthetic cell. So have, how many of you have heard of Craig Venter and synthetic biology? Okay. So um, uh, in the biological world, all cells come from other cells. You know, that sounds obvious. Um, you can't take non-living parts and put them together to create something living. But what Venter and his team did was they took uh, uh, DNA code that they synthesized from chemicals, not they didn't take from another organism. They took an empty cell, so one that wasn't alive, and they put that DNA into that cell and they created a living organism that can replicate and do all the other things that cells do. So they took the parts from different things like gene sequencing, gene synthesis, DNA watermarks that companies like DNA, if you, if you send DNA 2.0, uh, literally you type the code ACTGDD that you need, They'll send you a vial a few days later with microorganisms with that code in their genome. And then you can put that into your experiment. Uh, Ginkgo Bioworks is another startup that's doing this, the same types of things. So you take all those things from, from uh, mature technologies, you can recombine them into something new. And um, one cell doesn't sound very exciting, but the next slide is going to be very complicated. Let me show you. So this is again from one of our reports, don't even try and read it. What this says is this is a bunch of different classes of technology and biotechnology that are all being united to do things like here, bringing back extinct species. So not just cells, but can you bring the next slide? So mammoth haven't been around for 10 or 20,000 years, um, but the DNA is still there. DNA is a very sturdy molecule, so even an animal that's been frozen 
in the ice for uh, in the tundra for uh, thousands of years, you can still get DNA out of that that you can use. This is why when you go to a crime scene, they look for DNA. It's a very, very stable molecule. So researchers are trying to this uh, Spanish goat, the Pyrenean ibex, that went extinct. Three years later, they were since they have lots of uh, um, lots of them in zoos and things like that uh, before they died, they had enough DNA that they could actually recreate one and have a related goat give birth to that, uh, that species. So there are 14 of these going on. So it sounds totally crazy, but if you start looking at patents and scientific papers, you get a good sense of when this is likely to be able to be possible. So that's, that's really obviously big, expensive innovation. Uh, nobody's doing this in their garage. But what people are doing in their garage, the same way we you know, hack elec electronics and software, is there are biohackers. So this is uh, taking, again, obsolete parts. These are, this is an uh, old parts of an inkjet printer. Uh, instead of printing ink, though, they've t this is, you can still see it says HP, the cartridge. So they empty out the cartridge. They fill it with, remember my, the applesauce, the liquid with the little things floating in it? There's the cells. And they print out those cells in a pattern. You can't probably see this. It says, I heart biocurious. That's the name of the hacker uh, space where they're doing this. So they put the cells down on a, a pattern that they want, and the cells glow. So you can actually see what they've written. Now, this is a... This is obviously technology that's pre-market. This is something only you know, people who love technology do for its own sake. But you can see that over time, you could print cells in different types of patterns that would actually be useful, like maybe as a leaf or maybe as a sheet that worked like a leaf. So rather than printing you know, solar cells with, with uh, um, semiconductor materials, you could print cells that could do you know, a whole sheet, a leaf the size of this table, that might be able to do photosynthesis or you could print an organ because we can do 3D printing now. So if you need a heart, you don't need to find somebody who died whose heart you can put into yourself. You can take your own cells, print them onto a scaffold, and replace your own heart. So there's a company called Organovo that's actually doing that right now. Okay. So the third principle, and the last one I'll trouble you with today, is one we call technology shear. So shear is when two, two layers, for example, of a, if a, uh, these are moving at different speeds. The two layers of a table or two layers of the earth are moving at different speeds. They break off. They don't stay together. Okay? So the concept of shear. So the idea is if you have two technologies that are evolving at different rates, like, for example, a car and a computer, they shear off. They don't stick together well. And if you integrate them into one device, you're going to have a product that makes itself obsolete by because one of them is going to get obsolete before the other. So think about your navigation system in your car. Uh, Anybody have a car from about 2007 with a navigation system? You? Okay. So I do. Um, the navigation system is a little bit like my electronic football game. The display is, you know, kind of junky. Uh, the pixels are big. It moves like this when I'm driving. You know, it's not a smooth, uh, good-looking display like we're used to seeing on everything these days. Um, that's because displays and the computers behind them revolving very rapidly. So a display built in 2007 looks terrible today, whereas a car is the sa exactly the same model as you could buy in a, store in a showroom today. So cars are evolving slowly, displays are evolving quickly, and displays get obsolete very fast. So what do most people that have a car like mine use their display for? It's a nice flat surface to put a suction cup on so you can put your smartphone in there, right? It's uh, most people today will, in, you know, that's, this is how we navigate. Um, now, if you get a new car, the displays have stopped evolving. We have retina display. The displays in the cars are as good as they're ever going to get. And they'll get a little better. But they're not going to keep evolving. So today's navigation displays are probably going to last the lifetime of the car. They also integrate with Bluetooth to this. So you don't need to, for example, keep upgrading uh, that system. Because as this upgrades, you have just a link to that system in your car. So that's kind of like in those layers. The fast evolving layer and the slow evolving layer now have a lubrication layer. That's Bluetooth. So as this one evolves, Bluetooth will keep connecting the two. Make sense? Okay. So next, uh, next slide. So how can you know w navigation systems aren't really fundamental to the car? I mean, they're nice to have, but the system that's fundamental to the car, where this is happening today, and this is why the entire auto industry is freaking out, is be is autonomous vehicles. So who's heard of robotic cars or autonomous vehicles? Okay, again, about half of you. So um, 
we had this idea of a car, a robotic car, that you just climb in and say, take me to the store, take me to work, take me to school, um, and then you read a magazine and it drives you there. That idea has been around almost as long as the car itself. But it's also always been far off in the future, like space travel. You know, and Sputnik comes along, and then space travel is here. Well, the Sputnik moment for autonomous vehicles was about a year and a half ago. Google has cars like this um, that are robotic, that can drive themselves around. And um, they said, oh, you know, rather than that being something 50 years in the future, we've been driving between our two offices in Palo Alto and Mountain View or wherever it was uh, for several months now autonomously. So they had brought together all the technologies to build robotic vehicles, put them together, and put them on the road. And since there were no laws saying you couldn't do that, they'd been doing it. So all the, you know, Volkswagen, GM, Nissan, oh my gosh, you know, they, they, this, is, this is bad news for them. You're thinking, well, why is that bad news? Why would that be bad news for the car makers, not good news? Any ideas? The car becomes a commodity, exactly right. So think about what Google did to Nokia. Nokia was the dominant telephone manufacturer in the world. Google had nothing, Apple had nothing. It wasn't actually Apple that killed Nokia. So Nokia had a smartphone. They just weren't commercializing it very well. The, smart, the Apple phone came along, and that was pretty good. That was the Sputnik moment. But what Google did, Google's reaction was actually the one that changed the world. Google had Android. They'd been working on Android since 2003. So 2007, this comes out. 2008, Android actually gets mature enough. Um, Samsung, which was a junk phone manufacturer, definitely third tier phone manufacturer. HTC, you know, these, all these companies that had no ability to compete with Nokia, all of a sudden were right at the top. And they drove Nokia literally out of business. Microsoft bought Nokia a month and a half ago. The reason that they could do that was because the Android system made their smartphones equivalent or better than the, the previous generation of phones. This is why it was disruptive. So that disruption that Google now has could make Geely, a, a Chinese car manufacturer, or Tata, an Indian car manufacturer, able to compete with these guys. And, and Google has a history of putting these kind of guys out of business that way. This is, this is Nokia, basically. So they went totally crazy. Um, they also said, Google, the improvement is such that we, this is their experience curve, Within five years, we can make cars that are safer than people drive, and we expect to release it by 2018. So car makers, for car makers 2018, if they had to change the color of a car by 2018, they'd have a hard time being that fast. So, so an entire new system like this is way too disruptive for them. So this has become a top priority, robotic vehicles. Next slide. So I'm going to skip this for time's sake. Uh, so. Basically, what we've gone through today is these uh, gathering data for this green line, the sustaining innovations, to, to look at the disruptions, look at those use cases, identify adjacent products and industries, address the, the shear between different layers. Next slide. So um, how, how can we bring this all together and know where to look for the next generation of innovations? Next slide. So. Uh, just the same way that the Grand Unified Theory of Physics is not the end, Grand Unified Theory of Physics doesn't address gravity. Uh, so Einstein, uh, you, you thought we were done, we have one more thing. Um, in innovation, we're missing something here, okay? We have one more thing that we need to get to that Grand Unified Theory, which would be the theory of everything. And uh, Chris Anderson, uh, so I've given you a few books to read. Chris Anderson was the executive editor of Wired for a long time, but so an IT looking technology. He's now completely into hardware, 3D printing, drones and things like that. So he started a company called 3D Robotics that makes DIY drones, so drones that you can make at your house. Um, and uh, these are some of his books, The Long Tail, Makers and Free. Um, what he's focusing on here, you can go to the next slide, is uh, innovators themselves. So the people that are doing these innovations, um, if you look at these three models, we've got the, the uh, um, uh, early adopters. Remember, they were right here, innovators and early adopters. The disruptive technologies that leave the boundary of the firm. And then in this, the disruptive technologies. 
these three things are all one thing, and that's the person that's doing it. So the best way to forecast the future and to find where those future technologies are is find those people and see what they're doing. So you don't need to be you know, scanning the whole world all the time, every patent ever uh, filed, and trying to find a pattern in that. Just go to the places where these innovators are and see, you know, ask them what they're doing. So again, don't read all the text. You can read the slides later. Let's go to the next slide. So these are some of the areas that we know innovators are working on. They're things like you know, the future of these different industries. Um, uh, in vitro meat is just, so I mentioned printing cells. One of the first applications we're seeing for printing cells is printing meat. Uh, if you want to have a steak and you have to grow a cow, kill the cow, cut it into pieces, you know, put it on the plate and do all this, it's an expensive process. It takes a lot of resources. Um, it's, some people won't do it because of cruelty. So there's, you know, there's a, um, a process of extraction that we're just used to. But if you can take the cells that form muscle, print them onto something shaped like a steak, do some other things to make it edible and tasty, you would just print literally this much as opposed to all this much to make your meal. Um, there's a company called Modern Meadow that's doing exactly that. So uh, there was an, you might have seen this a few weeks ago, uh, somebody ate the first actual burger made of this type of meat. Th it's a, that's still a long way off, but they're being very smart about it. Rather than starting with something that's difficult to commercialize for safety reasons because of taste and a bunch of other things, they're starting with leather. So printing the material that makes leather. And you can see that's a good early step on that, that you know, road. So it wouldn't be uh, surprising if in a few years we actually have steak that never was alive as an entire organism. We'll see how it tastes, but that's a possibility. So we're looking at what these people do and then following that. So we go to the next slide, please. I was mentioning cars earlier. One of the best examples, I think, of disruption by small innovators is this. This is a company called Local Motors. This is their vehicle. It's not Photoshop. This actually exists. You can buy it. Um, so this is a car that was made through crowdsourced design. Um, they basically started this company. Uh, they produce, it's called the Rally Fighter. They produced it in 18 months from idea, yeah, yes. 18 months from idea to manufacturing. Most car makers, it takes them 60 months to start a new vehicle, like the, you know, sort of boring new cars you see on the road that, it took poor Toyota or whoever made that thing, 60 months and about a billion dollars to do that took them three million dollars. So we're talking about m a greatly reduced time to market, orders of magnitude reduction in cost to develop, and when you do that, this is where the real disruption is, you don't have to make a lot of vehicles to break even. So most car makers would consider a vehicle that only ever sold, say, half a million or a million units would be a failure. There aren't many, Ferrari can maybe do that. Most car makers need hundreds of thousands of units a, you know, a year on a global basis to pay for the um, uh, development and manufacturing of a car. They break even at 2,000 units. In fact, they're uh, not, sorry, they don't break even at 2,000 units. They're done at 2,000. They're only ever going to sell 2,000. And then they abandon it and they move on to the next thing. So the next thing is a motorcycle. So if you have a, a, a competitor that can basically just come in, do 2,000 units and get out, and then they can do 2,000 units again and again and again, they start to be able to address all these niche markets that your big production can't. And this is the real disruption, what we call distributed manufacturing. So 3D printing, uh, uh, hacker spaces, crowdsourced design, all these things are coming together to really disrupt manufacturing in the next few years. We see this as a huge opportunity across a lot of industries. So go to the next slide. <laughs> Another way to do this is standards. So this uh, device, is um, it's a satellite, as you can tell. It's actually in space. Um, what you probably can't see is that it's 10 centimeters on a side. It's a one liter volume. And this is a little bit like a shipping container. This is a standard called the Nanoset standard. And whatever you can put in that one liter, as long as it's not going to, you know, if it's not going to blow up or something, you can put whatever you want and it can go into space. So you have high school teams making satellites. You have countries like Colombia that don't have a space program making satellites. The electronics have gotten so small, we don't need to build this you know, bus-sized device anymore. We can put so much smarts in this little space and send it up because it weighs so little, you can send it up very cheaply, um, that 
almost anybody can have a satellite. This satellite has about three hundred and or sorry, thirty five hundred dollars, three thousand five hundred dollars in components. So it's a lot of you know experimentation and labor to put it there. But this is a satellite that you or I can afford. Um, the reason you can fly it up so cheaply, or even for free, is that those big satellites that we still make, you know, think of a, a big satellite that felt like this. To launch it, they fold it up into a little space in the nose of the, the rocket. Well, there's all these little pockets where a small little cube, literally this big, can fit. So they don't pay anything to launch these. You're literally riding like a hitchhiker for free. And then when that gets to its, its orbit, they all deploy. So um, I was at the All Russia Science and in, uh, Science Festival this weekend, which was a lot of fun, by the way. Uh, we talked about maybe this would be a good contest for Russian high school teams to compete on. You know, we like uh, you know idol these music competitions. We could have a satellite competition, and the school that designs the best satellite, we could actually launch. You know, if we had a ten or twenty thousand dollar budget, you could actually put Russian high school kids' satellite into space. So um, there the and. Just uh, there are two crowdfunded uh, nanosats uh, in space already, so that were from Kickstarter. So basically, the the big mindset change is you know, we normally think about innovation as we, we scan a market, we just sort of look around to see if we find something. Um, the change, what you should do, is look where in the spaces where something should be found. So go to these places where the innovators are. Go to those markets that I've told you are getting mature, um, and that's where you're likely to find opportunities. Okay, the other big mindset change is we usually think about technologies. Think about this as something you buy. How many people are gonna buy this? Okay, that's the old mindset. The new mindset is, what can I make with this? This is a part of my next opportunity. What can I do with it? And you know, similarly, all the other things around you that you see that are pretty mature and don't seem like an opportunity, they are an opportunity, but it's a, it's a component of the next thing. So, um, uh, Again, I would say just, just read this later, but the idea here is that um, through these types of technologies and the things I've told you about, those are the components for this next uh, way that we evolve business. And I've got just a couple more slides and we can talk. I'm, I feel like I should actually just skip these and we should go to discussion. But these slides talk about the future of manufacturing. And if you're, I was told back, this is what uh, Olga asked me. She said, we really like math. So could you give us a lot of math? So we have a lot of break-even and units and things like that. Why don't we go to questions, and then we can talk about math for people who want to. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So this is basically the, the same models that I've been showing you about why the, how the experience curves work. This is what distributed manufacturing, how it works, with fixed cost, variable cost, and so on, and the changes. The next thing is we're looking at funding. I said the future of funding. So venture funding is actually in the United States anyway, shrinking. So we're getting less and less money is being raised by the venture capitalists and less and less money is being invested by venture capitalists. And this is why. Venture capital fits a few markets very well. The markets where you have uh, a low fixed cost, or sorry, a low variable cost um, and things like software where once you've built it, you can sell it millions of times. You have a high leverage. You can basically have a high margin after you break even. Biotech's the same way. Once you discover the molecule, you can make lots of money because the actual component of that molecule in the drug is low, the cost. It's the, the revenue is very high. That's a great model for venture capitalists, and that's why venture capitalists have not liked hardware because hardware has a high variable cost. Every unit you make has parts that you have to buy. What distributed manufacturing does is changes that equation, and it opens up a lot more hardware opportunities. What we're seeing, though, is that there's uh, smaller ways to fund things. I mentioned uh, crowdfunding with Kickstarter. So the, uh, the guys making this watch couldn't get any venture money, but they could get money from consumers. Um, there's also corporate venture capital. So we're seeing you know, Intel, for example, BASF, Nokia is in this space. Um, they're all coming to bear. Conscience capital or impact investing, these are companies like Jeff Bezos, who founded uh, Amazon or Breakout Labs, one of the founders of PayPal, not Elon Musk, but the other guy, Peter Thiel. They have billions of dollars, and they set aside some of it for stuff like space and stuff like printed meat. So Breakout Labs is one of the investors in the Modern Meadow, the, the meat printing company. Uh, Bezos Expeditions, they're investing in a company called D-Wave that does quantum computing. 
So they d basically take risk that a lot of other people can't, but they're, they're sort of the new angels. Uh, there's competitions. So um, on Wednesday, I'll be talking at a conference that NASA is sp sponsoring about how to use prizes to incentivize innovation. And then finally, like I said, we've got crowdfunding. All these things together, these four new forms, will actually exceed venture capital funding in the United States either this year or next year. The, we can see the lines are going that way, that either this year or next year, these four, sorry, those bottom four will be more than venture funding. Okay, similarly with organizing, uh, we're seeing lots of ways of, for people to organize very quickly and then disperse. So there's a phenomenon called car sharing, where rather than going to rent a car, um, you can go to your neighbors and rent their car from them. So if I have a car or a house, I put that uh, a description of it on a site like Airbnb or um, the Relay Rides, and if my neighbors need a car, they search and they can see, oh, uh, I, I'm going to s go skiing, so I want to borrow a Jeep. So they'll borrow a Jeep for the weekend, pay the owner you know, $300 or $500, or you can rent them by the hour for $8. Um, you just walk over to your neighbor, pick up the keys, get the car, drive it, and the way this works is that the 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 company pays the insurance for that. So um, basically, you can instantaneously have a, a, a car fleet of thousands of vehicles all over a city. You don't have to buy any cars to do this. Same thing with houses. Airbnb is a if I'm going to a city, I can see if anybody there wants to rent out their house to me. Maybe they're on vacation. So for the price of a hotel, I can get a much better space to live in. And they get the money, it doesn't go to Hyatt. Okay, next slide. Um, and then this is uh, distributed manufacturing. We've already talked about this, so why don't we just kind of wrap up and go to the next slide. And then the next. Don't worry about this. This is just a summary of everything we talked about. Oh, yeah, so if you like the, all these ideas, um, you don't have to sit through all these slides. They actually fit together. There's a cube that you can make if you go to the next slide. Um, so that cube, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally losing my story here. Uh, when you think about things that are far away and big, they actually look the same as things that are close and near. And if you connect them, you can see how those things happen. So that's why these things that are very far away don't like slowly come at you over time and get bigger and bigger. They're actually right in front of you. And just by connecting them, as I said, integrating things to make this, that's how it happens so suddenly. So far is near. They combine quickly to get the big fast. Next slide. Uh, thank you. And um, we'll have time for questions and comments. The last thing I wanted to show you is if you, if you like these, one more. If you like all these things in one slide, you can print this out cut it out and it folds up into a cube that you can put on your desk and it will remind you of how all these innovations fit together. And uh, yeah, then you never have to hear me ever again. Okay, so that was it. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, happy to take discussion. He just started his uh, Drapier University of Heroes. He moved from uh, Menlo Park to um, San Mateo. And I asked him, Tim, why are you doing this? He said, oh, look, um, I'm thinking about venture capital industry. And uh, frankly, I think it will be changed a lot. And uh, I'm trying to rebuild a new venture capital industry through all the uh, methods and uh, mechanisms that you just mentioned, like crowdfunding, um, outsourcing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can you just elaborate a bit on it? Uh, when do you think venture capital industry will be in 10 and 20 years? And because even now we can see the big changes because we see a lot of mega funds like Sequoia, like Underseen or Greylock or Nea, and uh, we see much less uh, smaller players. So we think that it's, uh, it's a great tendency, and can you just tell yeah. how do you see it? Yeah, so um, the, uh, 
the thing that I mentioned about venture funding in the U.S. is actually starting to decline. It's been consolidating for a long time. And in any industry, it could be the automotive industry or the air airlines, anything. When you start to see fewer and fewer bigger players and more and more concentration, that's the sign, just again, like with aging, that that is maturing and that the competitiveness and the growth is going to start to, s to slow down and eventually go away completely. So it's not the end of the venture capital industry by any means, but the, the things that are driving that um, are, I don't think it's like, this is not just sort of, oh, this is just a little downturn, it's gonna get better later and we're gonna, it's gonna change. So I think that, um, as you, you pointed out, some of the, the changes in the way we fund innovations that um, they're starting to look at. And the four that I mentioned, I think, are four strong candidates right now. So again, they were uh, competitions where you've got a, a prize money for a bunch of competitors. So the X Prize is probably the best known example of that, or even the Nobel Prize. Um, that actually is a way that drives a lot of innovation, not because the innovators are the only ones that win. Everybody in those competitions benefits. Um, you get mentorship, you get connections, you get networking, which is why you go to a venture capitalist. It's not because of the funds. You need the mentoring, the connections, the, all those things. So you get that through a competition and you don't have to give up part of your company. Uh, same thing with the, you know, the conscience capital, the impact capital. You're getting funds and you're getting that mentorship, but you don't have to give up. Generally, the terms are much better for an entrepreneur than they would be for a, a traditional VC investment. Um, with uh, the corporate VCs, corporate VCs, they look at you as a supplier or a technology they want to integrate into their portfolio. So again, they're not going to, they don't have to drive as hard uh, uh, terms. They have to drive a hard bargain for them to be happy with the investment. So again, that's a, an alternative that's very attractive for the uh, entrepreneur. The biggest thing though is that they really have kind of a, it's not a guaranteed exit, but they have a guaranteed offtake partner guaranteed you know, mentorship. And then uh, finally, the crowdfunding thing. I don't know how big crowdfunding can scale, and I don't know how diverse it can get. The thing about crowdfunding is not that I think it, I mean, I think it will get big, but um, so there's a, uh, if I said, I'm gonna give you a million dollars, you'd be really happy. But if I said, that million dollars is all in five cent coins, it's in nickels, and it's spread out over a three kilometer field, you wouldn't be as happy. There's, n you know, it'd be very hard to pick up all that money. Crowdfunding addresses needs that I think only very small angel investors could address. So it, it complements venture capital more than it replaces it. So I think all these things, it's kind of like when we talk about energy, we know we're gonna have a portfolio. We aren't gonna just, is it gonna be coal, nuclear, or oil? It's gonna be all. And I think that's what's gonna happen here. Venture capital will be not the predominant thing. It's kind of like oil in the energy equation. It'll be one of many things that we use. And different situations will call for different funding uh, structures. Is that, yeah? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Alexei Nikolaev working for Intel here in Moscow. So Mark, thank you very much for very interesting and inspiring lecture. A, a lot of ideas just thrown down in my notebook. So thank you very much. And um, my question relates to, if you wish, infrastructural organizations. Currently we are at RVC office, and as well you know in Russia there are a lot of efforts towards creating some chains of technoparks, incubators, accelerators, all, all, all this stuff to support new technologies. So in view of your, your research, how technologies, markets, business models are evolving, um, what do you think, what, what will be the role currently and say three, five years ahead for these organizations like incubators and accelerators? Thank you. So, um, so incubators and accelerators, uh, I think work really well for certain types of technologies um, because it's a very structured environment and it protects the entrepreneur from a lot of the just day-to-day -day things that can kill a small and growing company. Um, the, the thing that I worry about with incubators and accelerators is that a lot of the point of being an entrepreneur is getting the crap beaten out of you every single day. Like there's always something going wrong. And it builds you as a leader and it builds the, the strength of your organization by having to deal with completely crazy problems that you never knew you were gonna have to deal with. And so I think uh, you, you can look at um, incubators and accelerators 
they will work well if you don't eliminate that component of competition. So you're basically, you don't have to worry about some of the really, um, uh, you know, again, the basic things, but you need to make sure that even though they're in an incubator, they're constantly getting outside. They're being exposed to, for example, competitions. They're being exposed to competitors, being exposed to customers. People that will challenge their ideas, you know, the incubator is actually not safe if you only stay in it. Th one of my favorite phrases is, a ship is safe in a harbor, but that's not what a ship is for. Вы можете задавать вопросы по-русски, у нас есть переводчик. Марк, uh, the second bit of provocative question. Uh, actually, great lecture, and uh, I really uh, more than 100% agree with all implications, but uh, the one thing uh, bothers me a lot, what should we do here in Russia? Because all this lecture is applicable to the small part of um, United States, uh, namely Southern and Northern California. We have everything uh, in 30 minute drive, like uh, thousands of angels, thousands of entrepreneurs, uh, tens of venture capitalists, and what is very important, companies that are ready to, um, to innovate. So uh, here in this geography, and uh, Russia is not alone, uh, I think this is the problem of most uh, other countries in the world, all countries, frankly, uh, except one, I think, Israel, uh, that we have a different agenda in innovation. How do you think, what should be our Russian agenda uh, in this context? Okay, so um, this question comes up a, a lot uh, in different you know, parts of the world, and um, you know, so I live in San Francisco and really, as you said, I sort of live and breathe this all the time. But I came to San Francisco from Stockholm. So I was living in Sweden and um, in 1997, the, I joined a small startup in Stockholm that asked me to go to California because I'm American and help their, build their office there. Um, what I saw in Sweden from, uh, so I first studied in Sweden in the late uh, 80s and early 90s. And Sweden was a lot like Russia and Germany and every other country in that sense where you had an engineering mindset. Innovation was viewed as risky and sort of a bit suspicious. If you're an entrepreneur, you were probably just stealing money in some way and not paying your taxes. So there's a, 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 a strong degree of suspicion about new companies. If you, in Germany, for example, if you ever had a company go bankrupt, you could never be a director of any company ever again by law. And so a lot of countries face this climate. Uh, it's a you know, cultural and finance and legal uh, structure where it's very hard to be an entrepreneur. And what I saw in Sweden that changed that was not any change in the laws or any incubators or things like that. It was a few leaders, so individual entrepreneurs who were very loud and drove everybody crazy. They hated them because they're just like, oh, that guy is in the news again. I'm so sick of hearing from so-and-so but they changed the culture. And if you look at what happened before they were in the space, where all these un engineers would say, that's never going to work, and did you really check your math? And it was just a bit of a, you know, that was their mindset. Now, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, even in college, you know, the, you should always have a startup while you're studying, you know, there's, so, so that thing, more than all the other structural changes and incubators is what needs to happen. The reason that's so hard is in leaders are, are Sputnik moments. Nobody knows when Martin Luther King is going to show up. And you know nobody knows when these historical figures will arrive. So your job as venture capitalists and as Russians who hope for a brighter future and innovation, maybe you're that person. You know, maybe today you walk out and you say, I really need to start talking to the press. I really need to start. Um, challenging students that I meet. I need to do those things. Or maybe you know that person and you need to start encouraging them to do that. It's really hard to do. There's no, as far as I know, no magic formula. But everywhere it's changed, that's what's happened. It hasn't been anything else. It's been a few voices that help each other out by 
you know, having those open debates by really challenging their societies. So maybe that's you. Maybe it's somebody else here. So I don't have a, a more formal, you know, mathematical answer for that. But yes. Second question, if possible. In your lecture, you mentioned this um, autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. and also you put like possible, possible future mm -hmm. that some brands that are not so well known currently will 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 rule the game. And uh, the question is, what what do you see? What what is the future for say Volkswagens or Toyotas or some other mass car manufacturers? Just to be. Uh, component supply for some bigger systems yeah. or what 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 is the yeah. future for certain sort of businesses i mean having a lot of capital expenses having a lot of uh legacy of manufacturing plants supply chain and so on that that's very difficult to get out of this yeah uh, so the um car makers are as a as a group not in great financial or organizational shape. General Motors was just saved from death, and I don't think that, I think next time they're just gone. Um, uh, uh, Chrysler was bought by Fiat, so w I think the consolidation in the car industry, we can do things to sort of keep that from getting any faster, but I do think that the automotive industry is about to make a big, big, big change, and it's one of these, it's like, Say in you know in your industry in the 80s we had all these big mainframe manufacturers and then PCs just <laughs> killed all but you know a few of them um, and uh, you know now we're seeing the the those companies so you know Dell is in trouble HP is in big trouble so we think of all these companies imagine remember how we thought of Dell and HP say 10 years ago they were like uh, the most amazing companies right their CEOs were rock stars and we all thought oh these guys are right and now they're like they kind of smell bad, you know, they're just not, just old, right? So it's not, it's, it's hard to imagine this with car makers, like, okay, could Nissan really go out of business because of autonomous vehicles? Could GM really get, you know, taken under? Yeah, they absolutely could. So it's not, also, it's, it's not just Geely and Tata and those car makers, it's also, there are a lot of uh, suppliers that are very strong that actually make the vehicle for the car manufacturer. Why should they not just make a Google car? It's just a rebranding thing. Because the car manufacturers have become like Nike or Adidas, where they don't actually make the things. They, they make a lot of it. But there are a lot of other people that can make it too. So I do think it'll change very drastically. And it won't just be a gradual decline. There will be another economic cycle that just you know takes out the weakest ones. And then the whole thing will start to tumble. Other questions? Yes, in the back. The future of brands as such? Yeah, so branding is uh, uh, a tricky phenomenon because why um, brands succeed, and this is, there's a lot of psychology, not a lot of science in this, so this is just what I think how it's gonna change, and I wish I had some data to prove it, but um, in the past, brands stood mostly for quality and reliability. So, and I'm talking the past 50 years ago until now. So the emergence of brands um, mostly was a, a, you know, a, a post-war phenomenon where you went from small manufacturers to large-scale production. So then you started to have global brands. And so brands like Pepsi and Coke and stuff in the 70s were globally, they were, you know, started trying to be new and fresh and innovative. And mostly today, they also have a very difficult time because people challenge the health of the product they challenge how it's made, you use so much water. Uh, they challenge the fact that it, it uh, runs smaller local companies out of business that people like. Um, and they're really struggling to find a way to stay relevant and uh, new and exciting for now the third or fourth generation of consumers without seeming really old. And they're, you know, they're, they have a lot of money, so they have a lot of time to figure it out. The brands that uh, come up um, like I'll just take Starbucks as an example. So Starbucks actually was founded in the s late 60s. Uh, in the early 90s in the United States, it just went, it, that's when it really took off. 
And this was another one of these like Sputnik moments. It was not because we hadn't had coffee forever. It was just like it was very good coffee, but it was the brand. So the brand kind of became the symbol of this new, you know, new way of sort of spending your your break time is drinking coffee instead of drinking a Coke. Um, Starbucks today is where McDonald's used to be. Like we used to say, oh, you know, if you don't study and get good grades, you're going to go work at McDonald's. And now we say, if you don't study and get good grades, you're going to go work at Starbucks. Starbucks now has this brand problem. And so these brands go through these cycles. I think what's happening is they go through them faster and faster. So a brand like Pebble or the local motors, I don't see those being brands 20 or 30 years from now. I see them being really strong brands for a few years and then being gone. And um, a lot of this is our ability to communicate you know, brand ideas and product ideas and, and things through social networks that are now not just word of mouth. If you remember the very earliest research was social awareness and then adoption by imitation. That imitation happens globally and instantaneously now. And through you don't just know the people that you're physically located next to, your family and neighbors. You know people all across the globe. And this isn't just like us techno people, this is a, you know, the, you know the, the early adopters of brands, the students today, do this so much better than any of us do. So I think that that's only going to accelerate faster and faster, and at some point, I don't know, the world blows up or something, so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, so that's it. That's what our company does: is we look at um, technological innovation from both a technical and a sociological standpoint, specifically the sociology of commerce. So we don't look at things that are only sociological. We don't look at like banking brands and stuff like that. We only look at hardware, pretty much, and a few few software-related things. Um, I think that the um, you know, the the progress of technology is mostly constrained by, uh, by physical factors, and it's important that we understand those. But there are also sociological factors that can accelerate or decelerate that fundamental um, improvement. So we know, for example, like the experience curves. So there are technical reasons that things reach a limit. Um, so with Intel, for example, 20 nanometer feature size Beyond that, you get into quantum effects, and you know, th we know that that's, that wall is there. It has been for a long time. Um, in bio-based uh, fuels for automobiles, um, cars can only take about 15 or 20 percent ethanol, um, and then you start to get it, it burns hotter, it corrodes the tubes and things like that. So we know there's a limit of 20 percent. So we have to understand those limits. On top of that, you put sociological things, and it's not just the external ones, like we'll consumers buy it, uh, will regulators approve it. It's also the sociology of innovation. So one of the things that we track, I mentioned partnerships and investments, those are also a good leading indicator of how quickly a technology is going to evolve. So um, we'll map uh, all the players in a space and the partnerships between those spaces. And initially it looks like a field of stars where they're all just separate, they're not connected. And then you start to see a few connections over here and a few over here and some clusters starting to form. And then those form super clusters. And so it's a, the star analogy is a really good one. And we have uh, statistical methods to say what, um, there, there are terms like the diameter of that cluster. The, um, anyway, you can, so you can measure this in a number of ways. And it's not a perfect measure, but it gives you a very good sense of is this still expanding or not. Uh, so it gives us about a two year lead on I would say compared to investment dollars, we can see, okay, about two years from now, this is going to be pretty consolidated and a difficult space to enter. Thanks. Okay, that's okay. No, no, I, I'm here. I'm, it's your time.
this is the question that uh, bothers me <laughs> a little bit. We're good, and uh, we're getting serious. Sometimes. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is there a uh, development in terms of a psychological capacity mm -hmm. of a human being? How to adapt to technological mm -hmm. and social innovation, which uh, is uh, actually accelerating? The pace is growing. And uh, how come are we getting stronger or are we getting weaker in terms of our capacity to adapt and mm -hmm. uh, to use it in, uh, in, uh, in the way for better, I would say? Yeah. Okay, so since we're doing math. This is kind of how we think of innovation all the time, right? You are here. It's all going to get super fast. It's been slow in the past. That's, that's our standard model of the, the pace of change. And this is why our grandparents can't understand what we're doing and why we think our kids are crazy. Um, so the thing about an exponential curve is it looks the same no matter where you are on it. This could be 1 or 10. It doesn't matter what the scale is. So I think that we are always on this, right? That's our inherent capacity. So every generation is always going to improve in its ability to you know, adopt these things. And every past generation is going to look at it and go, eh. Mm. So the question, <laughs> the question is for you, and personally, when do you, when do you give up? Like my kids, um, uh, this, I've seen this very rapidly with my own kids. So my daughter, who I have an, my oldest daughter is 13. She had a, you know, an old clunky phone. And then she had a, a, a new phone that was hers that she didn't just inherit from me. And then finally for her birthday this past spring, I gave her an iPhone. It was an old iPhone that we already had. But um, so she was so excited that she got a smartphone. Her sister, her little sister's 11. And I had another smartphone that I didn't like. And I gave it to her a few months ago. The older daughter is outraged that she, her little sister, got a smartphone first. And I said, you have to get used to this, because your little brother will never have anything but a smartphone. You know, so even in the space of just a few years, that acceleration is happening. And you know, the way they, you know, again, every generation sees this. Like My kids tell me s about features that I didn't know about, about my own phone. Um, at some point, we get so old, we're like, you know, I'm just done. I'm not going <laughs> to adopt any more technology. I'm not going to read this stuff. Just leave me alone to die, right? <laughs> so when you do that, some people do that in their early 30s, and they're the laggards, right? Some people do that when they're 90. Um, one of the great things about the Science Festival is uh, you get to hang out with people that are 70 or 80 years old and still doing research, still asking you puzzles, and still. So it's a, this is a psychological question. It's not just society, but you specifically. Where do you want to be? So I hope that you'll. I hope we'll all keep up with this for a while. Hope in uh, 20 years we'll have another meeting like this, but it will, I don't know, all be floating or something. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, okay. No? You're just putting your coat on. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Hope to see you again as our guest. And, uh, uh, you can just uh, uh, continue off record <laughs> with Mark some time, I think. Uh, Olga, do have some time in this room, I mean. Very good. So uh, the official part is over, <laughs> I would say. So thank you, Mark. Thank you.